Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth. Today's saint is named Saint Monica. Now, she is a bit of a unique saint because she's actually most famous for the fact that she is the mother of another famous saint. You see, Saint Monica was the mother of Saint Augustine of Hippo. Saint Augustine is this well-known great saint of the church, a brilliant th theologian. Uh, he's actually a doctor of the church. And we'll be able to talk about Saint Augustine a lot more in the next show. We'll look more in depth in his life. But I think it's important that we start at the beginning and talk about the life of this amazing woman who was his mother so that we can learn from her in order to grow in deeper holiness ourselves. Now, I got to tell you a bit of a secret here. Saint Monica is the saint who I most often refer people to for prayer intentions. When people come to me and ask for prayer, I normally refer them to Saint Monica because she is a powerful example of intercession. Now, as a seminarian, people bring me a lot of prayer intentions. They're always asking me to pray for things that are going on in their life. And honestly, it's a real joy to pray for them. But do you want to know what the most popular prayer request that I get? I mean, by far, the most popular prayer request, the thing that people have on their minds and hearts the most, it's this. Mothers praying for the conversion of their family members. I am always being asked by mothers to pray for their wayward children who are engaged in a sinful life or have left the church. I'm always being asked by wives to pray for their husbands who no longer have a faith in Jesus. And one of the reasons why I send all of these people to the intercession of St. Monica is because St. Monica had to endure all of that in her life too. And this was happening long before I was a seminarian. I remember when I was maybe 11 or 12 years old, we had been reading in our house. My parents had been reading the story, the life of St. Augustine. And I remember learning about St. Monica and how she had prayed for her son to leave his sinful life and become a saint, which he did. And shortly after this, I was outside my parish church back home on the steps talking with a distressed parishioner. And she was telling me all about how none of her kids went to church anymore and her husband didn't go to church anymore. It was just her. Now, I assume that she knew about St. Monica because that's what you do when you're 11 years old. You assume everyone's life is like yours. And so I just told her, well, why don't you just pray to St. Monica? And she said, well, who's that? And I said, well, St. Monica prayed for her son who was really bad and he became a saint. So if you pray to St. Monica, that will happen with your son too. And she kind of smiled at me and she said, well, I'll, I'll look more into her life and I'll pray to St. Monica for this. So this has been happening for a while. I've obviously gotten better at it than when I was 11 years old, but I like to refer people who have family problems, divisions, refer them to St. Monica and her prayers because she's like a specialist that I refer people to. So St. Monica was born in the year 333 AD in a place called Tagast. It's in modern day Algeria. And this section of the world was part of the Roman Empire at this point. Now, St. Monica was born into a Christian family, and we don't know too much about what her early childhood looked like. We don't know what her early life was like, but we do know that at a very young age, she was married to a man named Patricius. Now, Patricius was one of the city's minor officials. He was involved in the government, but he didn't have a very high-ranking job. And Patricius was not a Christian. He was a pagan. He believed in the Roman pantheon of gods. And for this and for other reasons, the marriage of Patricius and Monica was not a very happy one. Patricius lived a really dissolute life of drunkenness and debauchery. He was involved with other women. Uh, he really made life very difficult for his virtuous wife. Patricius had a fierce temper. He would lash out at his wife. He would make fun of her. 
And he was really frustrated with her because her life of virtue irritated him because of the uh, debaucherous life he was living. Her virtue made him annoyed. Now, on top of all of this uh, already, Patricius's mother, so Monica's mother-in-law, was also a pagan, and she could be very cruel to Monica. And the two of them would actually team up together in the home to mock Monica for her life of prayer and almsgiving Monica love to take care of the poor and the destitute in the city. And Patricius and his mom would make fun of her and poke her and drive her crazy. Now, despite all of their abusive behavior towards her, Monica always acted in a very loving and patient way. She was always going out of her way to serve them, even though they made her life so difficult. And because of this, even though she irritated him, she earned a grudging respect from her pagan husband. He didn't understand her Christianity. He didn't want to understand it, but he at least had a grudging respect for this woman that was able to take so much abuse from him with such patience and kindness. Now, Monica, one of the things she would do was visit the other women of the town who were having family troubles, who were having marriage troubles, trouble with their children. And what she would do is she would give them advice and she would lend a listening ear to their problems. And so she became very well known as the kind person who the women of the town would go to and unburden their family problems. She was well loved by all of them. Her loving words and example, they really had a marked effect on many of the families who lived around her. Many of the families had their marriages restored and, and their children were brought back into the family through Monica's gentle advice. Now in their own family, Monica and Patricius had three children. Augustine, their son, was the oldest. Then they had another son named Navigius, and then they had a daughter, Perpetua. Now because he was a pagan, and also to irritate his wife, Patricius would not allow his children to be baptized, and this caused Monica great anxiety. She wanted to pass on her Christian religion to her children, but Patricius wouldn't let her. Now, Augustine, their oldest son, he got very sick as a child, and after much pleading, Patricius grudgingly gave permission for Augustine to be baptized. But Augustine recovered in time before the baptism happened, and so when he saw that, Patricius removed his consent, and so Augustine still wasn't baptized, much to Monica's chagrin. Now, despite her husband's obstinate behavior, Monica loved him and continued to pray incessantly for his conversion. Tradition has it that she wept almost every night, begging God for the conversion of her family, until eventually, Patricius relented. He converted to Christianity. He was baptized only one year before he died. Now, even Monica's mother-in-law was affected by the prayers because she too became a Christian. She was won over. She was converted by Monica's prayers, patience, and love in spite of all the abuse that she had thrown at her over the years. But even though Monica's husband had become a Christian and then died soon after, and Monica's mother-in-law had become a Christian, Monica still had family problems. In fact, she had a new problem, her son, Augustine. Her other children had become Christians. In fact, Navigius and Perpetua would later go on to join a religious life. But Augustine was not having it. Augustine was causing his mom a lot of trouble. He was lazy. He was disrespectful. He was rebellious. In fact, he was starting to imitate the bad habits of his father in living a wild life, a partying life. And so Monica sent him off when he was only 17 to go to school in Carthage. She needed some separation from him. She thought that if he went out into the world on his own, maybe that would help him smarten up. But while he was at school, Augustine got into even more trouble because while he was at school in Carthage, Augustine became interested in a religion called Manichaeism. 
And this gave his mother a lot more to pray about. She wanted him to become a Christian. She wanted him to become baptized. But Augustine got involved in the religion of Manichaeism while he was off at school. Now, Manichaeism, if you haven't heard of it before, it was a, a syncretistic religion, which meant it was this religion that tried to pull together all of the major religions that were happening at the time into one kind of confusing mess. So it involved Babylonian paganism, kind of this pantheon of gods. It involved Buddhism, this whole idea of separation from the material world and trying to find uh, nirvana, this illumination. It also brought in Christian elements and Christian language. And all of this is really too complex to get into for this show. We're not going to dive into the whole belief structure of Manichaeism. But basically, just so that you understand what Augustine was getting into, it was this dualistic religion. They believed that there was a, a good kind of God power of light that was struggling with an evil God power of darkness. If you watch Star Wars, it was almost like the light side of the force and the dark side of the force that was in all of creation. Neither God was all powerful, but they were both locked in this struggle. And the Manichaeans believed that uh, everything physical, everything material was evil, whereas everything spiritual was good, was the things that were filled with light. And so because of this, they taught that marriage was evil because it would bring more fleshly children into the world. Uh, they denied scripture. They denied that Jesus became incarnate. Uh, they were this kind of weird cult. And Augustine was attracted to this religion because they proposed that they understood kind of these esoteric mysteries, these Gnostic truths about life and the universe. And it fueled his pride that he knew these mysteries that other people didn't know. He also really liked Manichaeism because they taught that the spirit is all that mattered. And so it didn't really matter what happened with his fleshly desires. So Augustine, starting from his teenage years, was very involved with lust. He had a lot of escapades with different women. Uh, he actually fathered a child with a mistress at one point. He had several concubines. Uh, he had a wild and sinful life. And he liked Manichaeism because he could have these mysterious religious truths that he could pride himself on while not having to change anything about his sinful life. Now, when Augustine returned home from school to his mother, he returned as an arrogant Manichaean. And this broke Monica's heart. She was heartbroken when she had him at her dinner table and he was telling her all about his new beliefs and telling her all about his sordid life, all the details of his lustful life that he had lived while he was away. It actually was too much for her to bear and she kicked him out of the house. She couldn't take it anymore, but she eventually was led by God to welcome him back. She welcomed her son back into her home, even though it was painful for her. And she intensified her prayer for her wayward son, that he would convert his life and become a Christian. She begged the Lord with prayers and fasting and, and often crying out, weeping tears to the Lord for her son. No matter what she did, though, Augustine wouldn't listen to her. And so in desperation, she traveled to visit a holy bishop, telling him about her troubles and he was amazed by her faith, amazed by her level of concern for Augustine. And he told her that the child of those tears shall never perish, which gave her a lot of hope. In an effort to get her son to settle down, uh, Monica actually tried to get him to marry a respectable woman and start a family. But Augustine evaded that commitment. He evaded his mother's requests. He actually took on a new concubine, a new mistress instead. But despite his sinful lifestyle, Monica was, was resolved to continue to love him and to surrender him to the care of God as he wouldn't listen to anything she had to stay. She stayed close to him. She constantly prayed for him. She encouraged him to conversion until actually Augustine too, like his father, grew irritated by her persistence. And he was probably feeling guilty as well. And so he resolved to leave her secretly. 
So one day he said he was going to go visit a friend and he actually got on a ship and left secretly to take a teaching job in Rome. Now, Monica was not to be dissuaded. She actually traveled to Rome following him. But when she got there to Rome, Monica realized that Augustine had already sailed for the city of Milan. So not to be dissuaded, Monica followed her son to Milan. We have to credit her. She is a, a persistent mother. She's not going to give up that easily. Now, while in Milan, she took the holy bishop, St. Ambrose, as her spiritual director. And he helped her become the leader of all the devout holy women of the city. This was like the early nuns, the early sisters of the church. And since she had never remarried, she remained a widow. She was able to take charge of these women and lead them to become saints. So in this new role, Monica continued to organize regular donations of food to be sent to local monasteries and also to serve the poor. While she was in Milan, her son Augustine was being led closer to Christianity through the evangelization efforts of her spiritual director, Bishop Ambrose. And Monica was so overjoyed one day to finally see her son Augustine embrace Christianity. And he was baptized after 17 years of her praying for his conversion. Unfortunately, Monica would not have long to enjoy her son's newfound Christianity for very long. She died soon after his conversion. But near her death, she was able to tell her son Augustine, Son, nothing in this world now affords me delight. I do not know what there is now left for me to do or why I am still here. All my hopes in this world are now fulfilled. So these words of Monica show what's going on in her heart, show that she considered it her life goal to make sure that her family got to heaven. And she had prayed for all of them until it happened. And now she was content to leave this world and go to the God who she loved so well. She had spent most of her life praying for the conversion of her family. She had successfully led her husband, her mother-in-law, and her wayward son to the Lord before dying. Now, her son Augustine would go on to become a famous saint, a doctor of the church, and I promise we'll talk more about him in the next show. But today's show is about Monica, and there's a lot that we can learn from her. You see, Monica became a saint not by writing theological books and treatises, not to travel to faraway countries to evangelize thousands of people, Monica became a saint by patiently loving and praying for her disastrous family to come back to Jesus. She prayed for her drunk, womanizing husband. She prayed for her mocking, spiteful mother-in-law. She prayed for her disobedient, heretical son who was living this wild life of sin and lust. And she did it all kindly, with patience, praying for them, never giving up, evangelizing them, even when they didn't take it the right way, even when they mocked her, even when they tried to escape from her. She never gave up. And this is encouraging for all of us, because I don't know where you're listening from. I don't know what's going on in your life, but maybe you have a difficult family situation. Maybe you have a child who's struggling with addictions. Maybe you have a husband or a wife who has left the faith. Maybe you have children that are living immoral lives, living in a way that you never taught them to live, and it breaks your heart, and you don't know what to do. Well, you can imitate Monica. You can become a saint by loving your family as they are in order to lead them to Jesus, in order to win the conversion that you so desperately want. You see, Monica's perseverance paid off. All of them converted. In fact, Augustine became one of the greatest saints that the church has ever seen. His writings have impacted thousands, but none of that would have ever happened if it hadn't been for Monica. 
So never doubt that Jesus wants the conversion of your family more than you do. Jesus wants to win back your husband to come to the faith again. He wants to have your children amend their lives and come into a relationship with him much more than you do. So trust in his plan. Never stop praying. Never give up. Resist any temptations from Satan that he tries to tell you that it's hopeless, that your kids will never come back to church. But what Jesus offers you is the same thing he offered Monica. A plan for her family that involved her intercession, that involved her saying yes to what God wanted to do to her family in his timing and to never give up. So know this, God has a plan for your family and you can play a part in that. You can play a part in the salvation of your difficult family situations, whatever they can be, by your prayer and your patient kindness towards them. Now let's pray for the intercession of St. Monica for our own holiness and for the conversion of our families. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Monica, we ask for your intercession that all of our families, all of our friends, all those who it is most difficult to love would be brought to a life-changing encounter with Jesus through our prayers, through our example, through our love. Monica, we, may we imitate you in your patience, in your perseverance, in your loving, yet persistent evangelization of your family. St. Monica, like you, may we never give up. May we never give up on our spouses, on our children, entrusting them to the love of God so that all of us can be saints in the kingdom of God one day with you. St. Monica, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.